Well, hello, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, well, I didn't expect to be getting back to Mac so soon, but we have another broken Macintosh. This time it's a Macintosh Plus. And this one, when you turn it on, it just comes on like it's working normally, but then you get no display, and then you get a bunch of clicking out of the speaker and reboots, and it just doesn't seem to work. So in this video, I'm gonna try to figure out what's wrong with this thing. And if necessary, I uh, have another board right here, another analog board, so we might need to swap to that if I can't figure it out, and we'll go from there. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, so this Macintosh was one that I'm pretty sure I had fixed in the past. It wasn't on the recent Mac Repair-a-thon, but it was another one I had at home, and I gave this away to someone because they were looking for a Macintosh, and then it was reported that it didn't work. So let's turn this on and see what happens. Okay, we got the normal startup sound. And then we should have something on the screen, at least the memory test that's happening. And it doesn't look like we're getting anything. Oh. We're getting some raster lines if I turn the brightness all the way up. So that's a fault of some kind. And there it should... <laughs> so that's not normal. That is not normal at all. That's funny, like a bunch of clicking when it should have been probably booting up and then it just crashed and reboot. So we may have a problem on the analog board. We may have a problem on the digital board, like on the main motherboard. There it is doing that thing again, and it reboots. Okay, let's turn that off. Let's open this up and see what we find inside. Well, inside the Mac all looks pretty normal. I can tell I've been in here before because there's a replacement filter cap right here. That would be Arifa originally was there and I swapped it out with one of these little yellow ones. That is the uh, normal type that I keep in stock. Everything looks fine here. High voltage anode is connected correctly. The ground lead is there. The CRT neck here appears to be connected correctly. At least uh, this cable is there, is on, yep, that looks good. And the main power connector slash video cable that goes to the motherboard, that looks good as well. I need to throw the warning out there that before you work on these classic Macs, you need to make sure you know what you're doing because there are high voltages in this, not, not just the CRT high voltage, but mains as well, especially on the uh, power board here, which on this Mac doesn't seem to have a cover on it, which actually is a little, a little bit dangerous because your hands can very easily touch things that it shouldn't be touching. If you don't know how to be absolutely safe working on one of these things, then just do not do it and leave the work to someone who does. So I have the machine on its side here because what we need to do is I'm gonna use the oscilloscope to check a couple voltages. We need to make sure the five volt rail is actually good because if the five volt rail is low, for instance, then there's a good chance that the Mac motherboard is gonna misbehave and not work well. In addition to that, we can also poke around and check the video signal coming in from the motherboard just to make sure that we do have a video signal or don't have a video signal. We can also look for the sync signals as well. I'm thinking because I did see raster that we do have sync signals coming from the Mac motherboard. If you don't have any kind of sync signals, you're not gonna have high voltage or raster. The analog board on the Macintosh does not have a self-running oscillator on it. That means if you don't have a video signal going into it, you're not actually gonna have any horizontal or vertical deflection at all. And you're also not gonna have any high voltage going to the Macintosh CRT. You need both of those signals coming from the motherboard for the monitor to be operating. This is in contrast to most composite computer monitors, like say the little monochrome ones you had back in the day. Even if you didn't plug the video signal from the computer into the back of the monitor, the monitor is still gonna be running because it has free running oscillators for both horizontal and vertical that are gonna drive both the horizontal and the vertical deflection that can keep the monitor running, generating high voltage. And if you turn the brightness all the way up, you're gonna see potentially a raster on the screen. So we were seeing that on this Mac once I turned it on. That means that the motherboard was generating the sync signals but then we didn't have any video signals whatsoever. So we need to see if the video signal is even coming out of the motherboard here and then making its way to the analog board. Okay, so I have the mains now connected to the back of the computer, and that means I have to be very careful on this board because there's a bunch of it that's energized now. Even though the machine is off right now, I just need to make sure not to touch anything where there is 120 volts mains. All right, so the connector we have right here is the one that goes to the motherboard. So on this are carried the video signal, the horizontal vertical sync, but also the voltages. We need five volts and 12 volts to be looking good once we turn this machine on. Now I'm not sure which pins are which, so we're just gonna go through them. That looks pretty noisy, whatever that is. If that is the five volts, that doesn't look good at all. We could have some cap issues. There's a 12 volt signal. 
Also very noisy. That was probably the audio signal. Watch when we turn on the computer. That yeah, seems to be audio. Okay, we're looking at one of the sync signals there. I uh, don't know why it's not counting it, but that is definitely a sync signal. And the next pin. And this pin is another one of the sync signals. That looks good as well. Okay, so that testing was a little bit inconclusive. I definitely saw sync signals on there. I didn't see a video signal coming from the motherboard. And while the voltage rails were pretty noisy, I don't necessarily think that's gonna keep the system from running. You could tell that it was obviously powering up because we we're getting the normal startup beep and then it was having some issues. So I think we might be dealing with a couple, couple different faults here all at the same time. Before I proceed, I wanna see what the pinout is of the connector that goes between the motherboard and the analog board. I just wanna see which pin is actually the video signal. I'm trying to figure out why we're not getting any at all. So this website here has some schematics and unfortunately for the Mac Plus, they are extremely low quality, but there is the connector and uh, that is the video signal. And I definitely actually connected to that signal and I didn't really see anything on there except when I first turned it on and we heard the beep, I was seeing something. But then after that, it just went to black. And if we follow the video signal, it goes to resistor 30, 75 ohms, and it goes down here and then it gets to the bottom of the page. And it feels like these scans are cropped a little bit. So it's really hard to tell what's happening down here. So the video signal is this trace right there, which is five over. But you see how close together those are? If we go to here, which is a continuation of D, that's not there. And I'm, I'm scrolled all the way up right now. I'm assuming it goes off to the right, like it's one of the traces. But it looks like that might be the video signal right there. No, no, that's not it. I went looking around to see if I had another Mac Plus motherboard that we could do some tracing on, just so I don't have to take this one out of here. And I was able to find this Mac 512 motherboard, and while it's obviously a 512 versus a Mac Plus, I think they're very similar. So if we look at this pin here, which is the one next to the blank, that should be the video signal. And I, th and I think it goes to this resistor right here. Yes, it does. And this is probably 75 ohms, and it is. And on this motherboard, it makes its way right to this chip here, which is a PAL. So just to reiterate, it goes from the video pin on the connector to that side of the resistor. This is 75 ohms, according to the multimeter. And it goes from this side of the resistor to a VIA right there. And I think that makes its way to a pin on this chip right here, that one right there. So that confirms on the Mac 512, the video output is handled by this PAL right here. It's a PAL 16 R4. On the Mac Plus motherboard here, it goes from this pin to a VIA, which is right there, which makes its way down to this part here, which is labeled FB2. And the odd thing is, is that is not on the schematic we were just looking at. Anyways, it goes to this side of FB2, so that's a ferrite bead, which makes its way to a VIA right there. And I'm still not finding that resistor, the 75 ohm resistor that it says it goes to. All right, well, anyways, it doesn't have a 75 ohm resistor. It goes right here to this pin on this PAL right there. I put a little white mark on the pin that that goes to. So the, that pin right there makes its way directly to the video output pin on the connector there. Now that's a problem because if this chip is damaged, there are no replacements for this. I would have to take it off another Mac Plus motherboard off a damaged one. And because Mac Pluses don't have a battery on the main board, it's right here on the analog board, that means that these don't get battery damage like all the later Macs. So that means there aren't some of these that are just complete trash. And the worst thing is, I thought maybe it used the same PAL chip as the older Macs. The part on the old motherboards says BMU part is the PAL 16R4. And on this one, it's a PAL 20R4. So obviously that is not compatible. Now I shouldn't jump immediately to the conclusion that this part is bad. So what I need to do is just power this board up again and check the connection or the output right from this chip, just to make sure there's not a bad connection somewhere else on the motherboard. I mean, I know we have continuity, but for instance, once there's load on that line, maybe it's not getting through or something like that. Now, because I don't fully trust this yet, for powering this thing up, I wanna use this, which is a modern replacement power supply for Mac SE or Mac Plus motherboards, that is. And this little board here uses a Pico ATX power supply. And obviously I have this already wired up to allow me to use an RGB to HDMI. And this comes from picorc.com and it's an open source project. And there are replacement power supplies for many different systems. And I know I've shown these before, but it's just such an awesome thing. And installing this into the motherboard and connecting the ATX power supply allows me to test this Mac motherboard without having to rely on the flaky analog board, but I can also test it outside of the case here, which is a lot safer than having all these high voltages floating around and you know risking me touching things. 
Incidentally, the whole idea of this is you plug in your ATX power supply, which I'm gonna use a full size one here, but you use a Pico ATX into here. And then in this connector, you connect it to the analog board, like this one right here, with that same existing connector. And what that allows to happen is the Pico ATX actually powers up the part of this board here that drives the CRT and all that, and you don't plug anything into the mains input into this. We're gonna not use the low voltage power supply on there. You're gonna use the ATX power supply that's connected up to this. So you'll still have a working monitor, and you'll still have working sound, but you don't have to worry about trying to fix this analog board if the problem is in the power supply section. Obviously, if there's a problem in the CRT section of the analog board, you're gonna to need to do those repairs to get a working Mac. But at least you don't have to worry about the switch mode power supply in the lower half of this board, because this whole lower section here is that part of the board. You just can bypass that altogether. All right, moment of truth. I have the scope probe connected to the video output pin on the Pico ATX adapter board here. Let's turn this on. Oh, that's good, everyone. That is very good. Well, it's good we're seeing something, but I'm not really making sense of what we're seeing here. So we're seeing some activity there, and then we're seeing all this white. I don't know, I'm not sure what we're seeing here, because normally you should have a completely gray screen, which should be interleaved pixels. We should see gaps where there's horizontal refresh, and then there should be longer gaps where there's vertical refresh. Uh, it just doesn't quite make sense. Let's check out the sync lines here. All right, so there's the sync rate, 22 kilohertz, which absolutely does make sense for horizontal sync. It doesn't appear we have any kind of vertical sync signal at all coming out of this Mac. We'll check the schematics. Oh, no, I was on the speaker pin. Oh, verticals one over from that. Okay, there it is. There's the vertical sync at 60 hertz, and that looks correct. What doesn't really make sense is the video signal, although I have to say that the gap here between these two, that's got to be the vertical refresh because if I put this on auto and we switch back to the vertical sync pin, notice it matches exactly. So you know what? Now that we know for sure that the bigger gaps are actually the vertical sync, when we zoom in here, this is one entire scan line, and then we we'll have this, which is gonna be the horizontal refresh. And what is this telling us? That this Mac right now is just displaying solid white bars. So this thing is actually not even booting. So what have I been able to confirm? Well, there's video output, so that's good. That means that that PAL chip that generates the video signal isn't damaged, it seems to be working okay, but then this machine is definitely not running. And even though we're powering it properly with a good power supply, uh, we should have a working system and clearly it's not working. So we definitely have a few things that we need to fix here, but I think the first thing I wanna do is I wanna focus on the motherboard and let's not worry about this for now because currently I'm powering off a good solid power supply with my ATX bench supply. So let's, uh, let's try to fix this motherboard. All right, so the white screen you're looking at there is the RGB to HDMI. I'm gonna plug this in and yep, there we go. So that's what I thought we were seeing. So I actually thought we were seeing vertical bars. We're getting these horizontal bars. If I power cycle the computer though, let's just see if this looks different at all. Now nah, it goes immediately to that. Now this could easily be a RAM fault to be honest because the video memory on the Macintosh is driven right out of this memory. And this RAM that's on here looks pretty shady. It's these dip sims here, which I think are just one megabyte sims. And you know what? They're pretty warm as well. Let's confirm operation of this entire adapter here with the RGB to HDMI by using this Mac 512K motherboard, which I'm pretty sure is working correctly. Yes, and it does work. So uh, aspect ratio notwithstanding, don't worry about that. We have a good working Mac motherboard and yes, the flashing disc question mark, which is what we should be seeing. I'm back on the Mac Plus, let's just double check. Oh, hey, is this doing the exact same thing as it was doing before? Where we're getting, um, oh yeah. Okay, I think what's happening is exactly what it was doing inside of that machine, which is actually rebooting. I assume we'd be hearing the beep and then that clicking noise. Yep, there we go. I think what that's happening there is it's doing the reboot sequence. First thing we're gonna need to do is just get this memory out of here because I just do not trust this junky memory here. I hate this stuff. See, these have like pins on them. Oh no, these are actually surface mount chips. Oh no, they're not. The legs have just been cut flush on there. So yeah, we'll just get those out of there. Now it goes without saying that these SIM sockets here are the most fragile, easy to break things there are. So I like to use a tool to just carefully bend those over. Using your finger, it's very difficult to gauge how far you bent it over because you're sort of blocking the view of the clip. But if you use a tool, you can much more easily see that. Now it's not even a guarantee that this is not gonna break these because they are just so fragile after all this time. 
but there we go. I got those out and none of those are broken. Now, what I'm curious about is if I turn this on now without the RAM installed, okay, that is normal. This is what I would expect. If we had the speaker hooked up, we'd be hearing a bunch of random noise as well. That's exactly what you would expect to happen. Now, these memory modules here are 256K each. This is 8-bit memory. So four of these makes one meg of RAM. This machine does support up to four megs of RAM, but you have to set some kind of a... I think there's a resistor jumper. Oh yeah, it's right over here on the motherboard that you change this to enable that extra memory. I'm gonna install four megs of RAM, tested memory into this thing first. And uh, it will operate as one meg total until I change those jumpers on there, but it's a good enough start. And that's because I want this machine to actually, well, if I'm able to make it work, I want it to operate as a full four meg machine. Let's see if that changed what this machine does. Aha! There we go. This is exactly what we should be seeing, which are like the RAM test lines. We're basically seeing these like diagonal lines on the Macintosh. And if you have four megs of RAM, it takes longer for it to do the RAM test. I'm assuming that this thing is only gonna see one meg of RAM until we figure out the correct jumper configuration here and switch this. We should actually be able to boot the system here using the blue SCSI. So we'll just power this up and Mac Plus has built-in SCSI, which is so great. I usually keep a Macintosh mouse handy for such occasions as this kind of testing. So it's not booting. What's it doing? So the machine's not frozen. Hmm. Well, I have to admit, I'm quite relieved that the system is working at least to this extent. Although I don't know what's happening here. Why is it not booting off the blue SCSI? I'm positive that the blue SCSI primary boot image is system six, which will work on this thing. Oh, although I just realized the one thing about the Mac Plus and the blue SCSI is that it doesn't provide termination power to the attached SCSI device. And I think what that has the effect of doing is not powering up the SCSI device. So I think it sees there maybe is something there, but it's not enough to run the Raspberry Pi that's in here, the Pi 2040, and that's why it's just hanging. So I'm gonna use a little external power bank and I'm gonna power the blue SCSI directly and we'll see if that makes a difference. So like that, now there's a light in there. So we'll plug this into here, we'll power the system on. Now the one issue about this stupid thing is it shuts off. So I'm gonna keep pushing the uh, wake up button. The blue light just came on inside there, which would indicate that the system definitely accessed the, the virtual hard drive, but it's still not working. <laughs> Could well be there's an issue with the SCSI subsystem that's on this motherboard. And I'm gonna to try to use an external floppy drive here. I have um, Apple IIGS floppy disk drive here. And this actually has a 1.44 meg inside and uh, viewer donation, yes. Um, these are great because they work on Apple IIGSs and they work on Apple IIc pluses, but then they also work on Macintoshes, including older ones like this machine. And yes, even though this is a 1.44 megabyte floppy drive, it is backwards compatible with older machines like this that do not support high density. Okay, so I have a, just a random bad disk in there. I like to keep a disk stuck in those drives when I'm not using them. Here's a real Macintosh System Tools disk, which is from the Mac Plus. That should boot on this thing if the disk is not bad. All right, so system booted, that is excellent. Let's see how much RAM we have. It thinks it has two megs. All right, well, we'll need to investigate that a little bit further. So what we know for sure is that this memory here is bad. So I'm just gonna put some marks on this just so I don't mix it up with good memory. Next, I need to look up how to change this jumper right here to get this thing to recognize all four megs of memory. A quick Google search for Mac Plus RAM configuration brought us to this page here. I think this is something that Apple actually published on some CD-ROM in the 90s. Looks like it's telling us the actual configurations it supports are one, two and a half, and four megs. Hilarious, because we're actually getting two megs right now, so clearly uh, there's another configuration. For the one meg config that was in this machine with those bad memory modules, it tells us that we need to remove resistor R9 and leave resistor R8. And that is exactly how it is currently set up. R8 is the only one that's installed. So I'm just gonna follow what it says, and I'm just gonna use these little cutters here to just cut the resistor that's on here. So it could easily be reattached if someone ever wanted to go back to one megabyte of RAM. Don't know why that would happen, but just in case. And if we turn this machine back on, I think it's in the middle of the RAM test right now. This is completely normal. Those are those diagonal lines I mentioned before. All right, moment of truth, four megs or two megs? Four megs, excellent. And if there were a problem with the memory during that initial RAM test phase with those diagonal lines, then we would have gotten a sad Mac at that point or it wouldn't detect all the memory. So that's a good sign that this RAM that I installed in here, even though it's not matching, is totally working. 
Now, the question is, is what's happening with this machine when it comes to booting SCSI? Blue SCSI is connected back up. The power bank is woken up from its slumber. And let's see. Maybe with the floppy drive connected, it'll just boot that first. And then we'll have a working hard drive. There may be some configuration parameters that need to be set up in the Blue SCSI config for the Mac Plus. The Mac Plus is sort of fussy when it comes to SCSI devices. And it goes beyond the fact that it's not supplying termination power to the term power pin on the 25 pin connector, which is what normally would power up this blue SCSI device. I think there's a mod we can, we can do. Okay. It's booting off the disc right now, by the way, I think we can do a mod that can add that termination power to the SCSI connector here. And yep, it's not even seeing the SCSI devices at all. A quick search brought me to this page here and it says the mod is super simple. You just have to install CR1 on the logic board, which is this component right here. Just install a diode and then we'll have term power. I can see this spot on this motherboard that's not populated. So let me just add that diode right now. And there it is, the diode is installed. I just picked a random diode I had on the bench. I'm sure it's gonna be fine. The band goes towards the SCSI connector. And now with the blue SCSI, I don't need to connect the USB power connector. I can just plug this into the side of the machine here. And when we power up the computer, there we go, it powers up the blue SCSI as well. Now, I don't immediately think that the blue SCSI is going to work, though, not without a configuration change. So let's just double check before I make any of those changes. And it appears to be doing exactly the same thing, where it just kind of hangs and doesn't actually work. A quick search brought me to this page for the blue SCSI. It requires some special configurations. Go to here and click Mac Plus. Download a special INI file to place on your SD card. So here we are on the URL I talked about. We're gonna click Mac Plus and <laughs> there you go. You just put system equals Mac Plus. And we'll just put system is Mac Plus, which is what it says it wants me to have. Looks like the various systems that are supported on here are generic Mac Plus, Mega STE, and the X68000. Let's give this a try. I have the SD card reinstalled into the blue SCSI. I am crossing my fingers here that this thing will boot normally now. All right, excellent. So the floppy drive is connected, but I do not have anything in there right now. So it's not booting off that. It is booting off the blue SCSI right now. Yes, this is my normal Mac system boot. Awesome. So I don't really have any kind of like Mac diagnostics to run. So I'm just gonna run speedometer 3.06 here, which is the old version that works well on these types of Macs. And we'll let this run through just to make sure that the computer is fully operational. Now the Macintosh Plus is not as fast as the Mac SE and the Mac Classic. The Mac Classic and the SE are identical in speed because the Mac Classic is just an SE in a cost reduced form. But the Mac Plus actually has some performance implications that keep it from running as fast. And it has something to do with the way the video is sharing time with the CPU and stuff like that. I think it slows down RAM access and it slows down the whole computer from working. We should see that on these benchmarks that the CPU and the graphics speeds are not going to be 1.0, which is what they would be if this were Mac SE or Classic. And there's the performance rating for this machine. And indeed, it is slower than the Mac SE. It's not like it's really obvious when you use it, but it definitely has that CPU bottleneck because of that RAM contention issue or whatever's going on. But what we can tell by the fact that this ring ran successfully is that this motherboard does work properly. And honestly, the only issue with it the whole time was bad RAM. Well, and ignoring whatever might be wrong with the analog board, but that's it. And that's great because I was really worried that that PAL were bad and then we would be kind of up a creek with trying to make this thing work. But the reality is it does work properly. So everything is working great here. Next step, I'm gonna put this back into the chassis and we're gonna see if we still see those noisy voltage rails when we power this thing up. And I need to double check that maybe I was just measuring it badly, like I had my ground, I think it was clipped onto the, the chassis ground and not to the motherboard. I'm gonna retest that again, but I'm gonna clip onto these metal tabs right here, which is a good ground for the motherboard, just to make sure that we have actually noisy voltages like we saw initially. The motherboard's back in here, everything's reconnected. It's all very sketchy, but I just want to be able to show, you could see the screen here when I turn it on. We should have video this time because we know the motherboard is working. And with the bad RAM, we were not getting any video even on the RGB HDMI. I also have the oscilloscope probe connected to the motherboard ground as opposed to the chassis ground. And let's turn on the computer here. And of course we have what sounds like a good working system. And there we are, we have video as expected. And it looks good as well right now it has a flashing question mark for the disc that is not inserted and let's just check these voltage rails here 
All right, yeah, okay. <laughs> so that 12 volts looks fine, much better than it did before. And what is wobbling a little bit is the five volts. So this is the five volt rail and you can see we got kind of a ripple going on there. And then take a look at this. So we're set at 200 millivolts per division and A, it looks really quite noisy. And we, we do have 20 megahertz bandwidth filter on there. And look, if we turn that off, it's even worse. But I set up the cursors there and the cursor looks like it's about 126 millivolts. Is that too much for the Mac? Maybe, maybe not, but it seems a bit excessive in my eyes. So let's check out the caps that are on the five volt rail and maybe swap them out. I don't have schematics handy for this analog board, but I didn't really need it. All I need to do is look at the five volt rail, which is this pin right here, makes its way over here. There's an inductor right there, which makes its way into the switch mode power supply. And then there is this cap right here, which is the 2200 16 volt cap. I already swapped it out. I have a 25 volt 2200 microfarad cap in there. And this is the ground plane right here. So the negative is towards the bottom of the machine. This is the bottom of the machine. And that is the positive side. And I wrote a five right there. This is the transformer for the switch mode power supply with the high voltage stuff over here. And then this is the output side. And this is the part of the circuit that's rectifying the AC voltage that comes out of the transformer, turning that into DC, which is what goes through that inductor there. And then that is the bulk capacitance for the five volt rail. So swapping that is all you really need to do to try to fix any kind of noise. I'm not quite sure this is a bad cap. It looks like a very high quality cap, but we can just grab the tester here and just see if this thing tests good or bad. At one kilohertz, this particular cap is testing at 1960 or 2000 microfarads at 0 0.02 ohms. So I actually don't think this was a bad cap. It's quite possible that that's just how the five volt power supply is on this machine. It's just kind of noisy. I have the scope pro connected to the power supply and it's off and actually take a look at the noise that we're seeing right there. So let's imagine that that noise is just being picked up by the scope and the probe and all this, that, and the other thing. So we can ignore that amount of noise that we're seeing. If we turn this on now, it looks exactly the same. So I guess that amount of ripple on this power supply is completely normal and changing the power supply back to one volt per division. And we're on DC coupling and we can still see that waviness there, but I guess that's just normal for the Mac Plus power supply. All right, the Mac is ready to go back together and because it was super sketchy not to have any kind of plastic over the side here, just because if you ever take this apart, you might put your hand there or something like that. I went and found a piece of plastic I had and just cut it out, stuck it on the side here. I even cut out the little space here for the speaker just to help the sound resonate, emanate, whatever inside the computer. And then I hot glued this onto the side here. So it's a little bit better. And I wrote danger high voltage on here for whoever opens this up in the future, just to keep your hands away from it. And on the bottom of the Mac Plus, there is this little metal shield here, which just sort of goes over the bottom here. I think it kind of helps just make sure the motherboard doesn't touch the bottom of the plastic case. The Macintosh case is metalized on the inside. And it's possible that it could short out if you say bent the motherboard really firmly by connecting cables to it and bending it down or whatever. So I think that's the whole point of this little plastic shield. Not to mention there's some RF shielding going on here as well. It's all back together again. The back is a little bit yellowed, but the rest of this machine looks like it's a Platinum Mac Plus is in wonderful shape. It's really clean, very minimal yellowing on the parts you would see. And yep, very nice looking machine. So blue SCSI's plugged in, let's power this on. No more funky noises or crashing. And <laughs> in the end, of course, all that was wrong with it was simply the bad RAM. Uh-oh, well, I was about to say all look good, but <laughs> it is not good. There is still a fault. Let me get the camera in closer. All right, I hope this is showing up in the camera, but there's like a band sort of moving around in the image right there. And then the whole thing is jumping a little bit as well. So I was a bit quick to presume that the analog board that's in here didn't have any faults because clearly it's not working properly. Let me hit the side of this computer here. I was trying to see if there was a bad connection that a physical impact might show. If the picture was changing a little bit, that might indicate that there's a bad solder joint or something, but that didn't happen. And I'm still seeing this jittering and there's this bar right here where it's a bit brighter. Yeah, there's still something the matter here. I also noticed if we turn the brightness all the way down, this is the minimum setting. It should be black, the screen. It shouldn't show anything. So it looks like uh, this thing is not quite adjusted very well. I'm really hoping that this interference that we're getting here is coming across in the camera. 
but I see a little bit of interference like noise happening down here as well, sort of high frequency waviness. And then of course there's this uh, jumping around that's happening and it's worse on the bottom. And because if we look at the top of the screen, not only do I not see any noise or issues, but it's also not jumping around. Now I'm trying to remember exactly what type of repair I did on this analog board, because clearly I'd worked on it before. And I'm thinking the repair that I did on this was that it had a bad vertical deflection transistor and it uses a push-pull arrangement. Let's look at the spare one right here. Right here on the top part of this board, there are two transistors next to each other. And this is a push-pull arrangement where if one of them is bad, what happens is you get deflection like on the top half or the bottom half, but the beam is not able to deflect the rest of the way. And I think one of these was shorted on this board when I repaired it. And I don't remember if I put the correct part in there. And I'm wondering if I used a transistor that was not quite the right one. And if I recall, it was the lower half that was not working. And perhaps this issue here where there's a problem on this lower half is somehow a manifestation of that. All right, here is the board that was in that machine that was exhibiting that problem. You can tell because it's got my thing on there. So these are the two transistors right there. And this one right here labeled Q2 is the one that handles the lower part of the deflection. Now the two that are in there do appear to be a match set. So I don't know for sure if I've replaced it. And looking on the bottom here, that would be the bottom one. I can't really tell if I've worked on that. See how there's this red paint or whatever on all the components and there's not one on there. Maybe I've changed that. I don't really remember. This was quite a while ago and I didn't write on here anywhere that I had worked on it. But as I said, it was kind of obvious that I had worked on it because there was all these Sharpie markers around the caps and other components. Because I remember I'm pretty sure I did work on this and I did a bunch of troubleshooting to get it to work. And if we look at the part there, it's a Motorola MPS U51. And the other one there is a MPS U, maybe an 01, it's really not easy to see. Now one is a MPN and the other one's a PNP, I think that's the, the way these are set up, if I recall. And I'm just noticing, look at this little funky mod going on here. This cap here is connected to the board through a resistor. That's kind of amusing. Oh, incidentally, by the way, that was the cap I swapped out. I noticed that this cap here, I think is actually in play for the five volt rail as well. So theoretically, I should have changed both of these. Now let's take a look at this other power supply. This is that spare board that I had. And you can see that there's a bunch of hot snot or hot glue all over this thing around the caps and stuff. Now, if we look up here at this push pull arrangement, this has some of that hot glue on it as well. But there it is, MPS U51. So same exact part that's installed in the lower half. And just like on the other one, I can't really read what's on this top one. But let's just assume that this board is actually good. And other than a little bit of corrosion here from a leaky battery, it's in pretty good shape. I wanna quickly throw this back in the Mac for testing just to make sure this thing actually boots the computer and works. If it does, I'm gonna swap these two refills out and hopefully this thing is good and we can just leave this in the computer and I can fix that other power supply board of this one here at a later date. We have the spare power supply in this machine. Make sure if you do put one of these in temporarily, you at least put one of the screws here that screws the power supply into the chassis ground because uh, you need to make sure that connection is solid. <phone rings> Sounds like it's working. Oh, we don't have any video though. I'm uh, rotating the knob on the front. Do we have high voltage? Hmm. Can't quite tell. Ah, did you see that? Okay, we have bad solder joints. <laughs> so the connector that goes from the cable to the motherboard to the analog board is very typically bad. And uh, as we can see, that's exactly what's happening. But we are getting, if I just move the cable a little bit, there we go. We're getting a good image. It's a little bit shrunken, but nothing we can't fix with one of the quick adjustments on the side here. And this particular problem with the Mac Plus is extremely common. Mac 512 as well, Mac 128, it's all the same. We gotta take this plastic cover off here and then just reflow all the connections from the cables, like the one that goes to the motherboard, but also the one that goes to the deflection yoke and the one that goes to the CRT yoke. So this one right here, we gotta reflow all those connections, just make sure they're all good and that'll solve this particular issue. All right, so I went ahead and I peeled this down. There are little plastic clips here you just have to pop out from the backside here, and then you can peel the plastic down. I took out these two refas here, replaced those. Those are Y-class caps, 2200 picofarads each. 
And then I did go ahead and I reflowed the solder joints of all those cables, just like I talked about. And definitely a whole bunch of those connections from all three of the cables were bad. I could see those cracked solder joints. So of course the main cable here goes down to the motherboard that carried the video signal. There was a giant crack in that one, but a few of the other ones to the motherboard were also bad. And then the cable here that goes to the CRT neck also had some cracks in it, as well as this cable right here, which goes to the deflection yoke. And I've seen those bad solder joints actually cause while well, jittery picture, but also melt this connector here that's on the board that connects the deflection yoke. The horizontal deflection is relatively high power. There's quite a bit of current that passes through that. So when those bad solder joints are on there, that actually causes a bad connection, which causes excessive heat and can melt things. Luckily, this thing doesn't look like it's been used that much in this condition. So there was no melting or any evidence of any issues. What we should have now is a nice fully working Mac. So turn this on again. The fixed solder joints should result in, and yeah, good stable picture. Yeah, bumping on the board now, no issues. And I'm gonna grab this ceramic adjustment tool here, and I really like these. You can get these from AliExpress or whatnot to make adjustments to the screen. And that's because, of course, this is completely non-conductive, so you don't have to worry about sticking it into the holes on the side of the board here. Now, I just need to adjust the height, so it takes up a bit more of the picture. That looks a lot better. Yeah, it looks good. Otherwise, I don't see any issues. That rolling you just saw a second ago there, that was the camera. And the jitter that we had on the other board is definitely not there on this one. So that problem was not coming from the motherboard or any of the other components, because remember the deflection yoke and the CRT, that is all shared from what we were seeing before. All I did was swap the high voltage analog board here and yeah, all those problems have gone away. I think this machine is finally ready to actually go back together. So I'm just gonna put all the screws back in and, uh, and then we'll do a final test. <laughs> Are we ready for attempt number two? Yep, here we go. Power this on. It's all back together just as it was before. Oh, I need to put the little battery door back on even though it's got a bit of corrosion. If you do have one of these and you wanna have a working clock, all you need to do is solder a little CR2032 battery holder to the two contacts on the main board here, on the analog board, and then you can run it into this little compartment here. You just drill a little hole in it and you can actually leave the CR2032 in there in a little holder. You don't need a diode or anything because this is not a rechargeable battery. And that way it will keep the clock or it will keep the time. And yep, 2032 lasts a pretty good amount of time. And there we go, the system is booting up, looking good. Make sure we bump on it. Don't have anything cutting out. Nope, looks good. All right, the Macintosh Plus is fully operational. There wasn't a whole lot wrong with this one. What did we figure out? We figured out that there was some bad memory in there and I haven't seen this particular issue where the bad memory caused it to have that black screen issue, which kind of scared me for a moment, making me think that that PAL was bad, but no, nope, in the end, all was okay. And it was just that bad memory. So if you're working on a Mac Plus or probably any of these classic Macs that exhibit some strange issues like that, well, suspect the RAM. And that's probably the easiest thing for you to swap first off once you've verified, of course, that the power supply is outputting correct voltages. I've seen these Macs before exhibit weird issues similar to that if you're giving them like 4.4 volts from the power supply. So if the voltage regulation on the power supply is not right, then you might get some weird issues like that as well. As far as this board goes with the vertical deflection jitter, I put a note here to remind me about that. I'm pretty sure the problem is gonna be this component right here, the one I talked about in the video. I don't have any spares for us to try. I think you need to replace these as a match set, although I'm not 100% sure. I'm gonna have to ask my CRT friends who know a lot more about this stuff than I do. The only other thing this Mac had wrong with it really was this analog board that's in here now, and that was the bad solder joints. And then of course it had just these two reefas in here, these little Y ones. These boards often have X2 or X class reefa caps as well. That's the larger ones. And they sit in these positions right here. This one had one that I have obviously replaced, but it had this film cap. And the one that's in here now has two film caps, so those you don't have to worry about. Although they can get a little leaky as they age and that can cause some weird spurious issues. The funny thing to consider about these Macs, and you have to be careful, is that if there are X caps installed, that's the two larger ones in this position, they are connected to the mains all the time. The switch is after all the reefas. So just having this thing plugged in you could let the smoke out. And I know that from personal experience. I had a machine sitting over there on that bench plugged in and it was off and smoke started coming out of it. So just be wary of that with these Macintoshes. And I kind of recommend with these older machines, you should probably unplug them when you're not using them or use a power strip to shut them off when you're not using them 
precisely because of reasons like this. The Commodore PET is another machine that has reefa caps inside of the power plug inside the machine, and you can't even easily get to it. And that can also let go by just simply having it plugged into the wall and switched off. Anyhow, the big conclusion here is that Mac Pluses are generally very reliable, and this machine had nothing wrong with it other than it just needed some new RAM, and, well, I had those two little reefer caps and some bad solder joints. So it goes back to what I was saying when I worked on those Mac Classics recently, that these Mac Pluses are some reliable machines, and if you're okay with the fact that you can't have an internal SCSI drive, and they're a little bit slower than the Mac Classics and the SEs, then these are very solid and good machines. So if you enjoyed this video, I appreciate a thumbs up. If you found it useful, all that stuff. If you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They make it possible I do this full time. So if you want to become a supporter of the channel, there's a link in the description below. You get behind the scenes stuff and early access to videos and occasional live streams and other stuff like that, at least on the higher tiers. And uh, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. It really helps me out if you do so. And yeah, I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.